All right, so uh, I'm here today. I've got Jonathan Sheff, data scientist at Transit and former uh, former everything. It's been a little bit of everything. Uh, did Educator, did neuroscientist, researcher. Neuroscience, Harvard uh, master's degree, former English teacher, former stats teacher. Um, why don't, actually, why don't you, how do you summarize yourself? How do you introduce yourself, Jonathan? <laughs> it's hard. I think it depends to whom I'm speaking. Um, I, I've been in education for a long time, but very much stats and database in a lot of ways. I ran my own company for eight years and then um, I sold that and wanted to go to grad school. That's where I was in neuroscience and research. And I continued really focusing on stats. And on the other side of grad school, I've, I've been working in data science. Yep. And one of the things, you know, that I really want to get into is this, like this period that you went uh, after we worked together at Vanderbilt um, doing brain science stuff. Before you're, you are where you're at now as a data scientist, you taught uh, stats for yep. two years um, yep. in Oakland, California. Can you talk a little bit about like what your responsibilities were? Because this was not just a normal like public high school. It was a little bit of a different environment, I think, right? Yeah, so I've taught off and on throughout the years. So my career before grad school was in education. And so I've taught in the classroom before that. And right after grad school, I taught stats at a private school in Oakland. Um, my responsibilities there were, were teaching stats, but also developing, developing a, a curriculum around stats and integrating it within other curricula. And also um, I collaborated with other teachers on really bringing in programming and current affairs and, and, and sort of like statistical awareness into the curriculum. Right. And what is, what is statistical awareness? For me, the, maybe this is just my, my personal mission, but I, for me, I want us to be better citizens. And I think that, I think statistics is core to being a better citizen. Um, the, the time we're in right now with COVID-19 is a great example. Um, we're in a, I think we're in a, I think an article I read said this, it's not my phrasing, but we're in a golden age of misinformation. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to spread bad information. It's so easy with the way people pass links without sourcing and, um, and with the sort of polarized tenor of politics, like, very, very easy to spread misinformation. But it's also a little bit on us because I think our, our understanding of statistics and data is so, or it's so poor. Yeah. Uh, so when people blow off all these precautions around COVID-19, I, I can't help but think that they simply just don't understand the sort of very basic statistical explanations that are being provided. And maybe, and maybe that's, I don't, maybe that's not fair, but I think that's part of it. Yeah, that's interesting. I've been thinking a lot. I mean, obviously we've all been thinking a lot about this um, pandemic, but then, yeah, this whole piece of information and what, um, you know, what do you do with the information that's provided to you and how do you, like, how does, how do you get your message across and, and uh, is, is the message getting across because, you know, there's, there's certain things uh, like models that are have inherent uncertainty in them yes. and they get revised, they get updated as we move along and get more information. They get uh, multiple models might have differing opinions and then, uh, and not opinions of course, but predictions. Yep. And, you know, from a communication standpoint, I don't, I don't know how widely understood, um, that sort of uncertainty, both uncertainty and probability. Uh, oh yeah, that an outcome is going to happen gets conveyed. Related is, um, I would say, uh, what what the argument most people make sometimes when they when they're trying to be informed is is oh I read a study right right I read a study and so this is true right and that. That's definitely one of my pet peeves. I, I think you and I have talked about this before, but like one study is not truth. 
one study is part of a, an entire body of research that is that is trying to get an right. Uh, I think I'm dropping you a little bit. The idea is to be tested. There you go. Um, Sorry, I think I dropped you uh, uh, for a second there. I think my VPN was was causing problems. But oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, you're saying one, one study isn't true. It's uh, it is you know it's pushing forward. It's you know it's providing evidence essentially. And the, so a huge part of science is replication, right? And uh, one study alone with among scientists. No one ever thinks, ah, you found the answer. <laughs> you know, that, that whole thing that happens in movies where it's like, you know, you do one thing and it becomes truth. Like that doesn't happen. Like you do, you do a study and someone else tries to replicate and someone else tries to replicate. And over time, maybe there's a body of evidence that you've found something. Right. Um, whereas I don't think the public understands that. They just find a study and say, ah, it's true. But for any one study you find supporting one point of view, there are also other studies supporting the other point of view. Right. And I think that's lost in the common discourse. Right, right. Yeah, and it's, I mean, it's, it can also get, um, it can get, it can, you can miss the, the forest for the trees as well. Like, right. you know, like if you're on the outside of the group and you see like, oh, these people are fighting and fighting and fighting and like, oh yeah, this, this group doesn't agree with that group about, you know, how fast it's gonna spread or, or whatever. Um, yeah, that's true, but it's like, it, but look at the group as a whole, right? Everyone's saying it's dangerous. Everyone's saying it can blow up. Uh, and, so, and so sometimes it's, it's uh, misleading to, to think like, mm -hmm. to talk about, you know, oh yeah, there's uncertainty in this model or there's uncertainty in that model or uh, when the, the larger point is, uh, is bigger than that. Um, so okay, so that's interesting. It's a little I'm, choppy for me. I don't know. Yeah, I'm getting. I'm a little choppy too. I don't know what I can do about that. Uh, it, it could be on my end. I don't know. It's better now. Maybe I can reduce the. I don't know. All right, we'll see. We'll just see how it goes. Okay. Um, the okay so tell me a little bit about um you know how what are the methods for teaching statistical awareness and uh um, yeah. how, does, how does that curriculum get structured and and pushed out yeah so um i mean i don't i don't have the answer but i can tell you what i've done i think one core part of what i did as a teacher was um we would we'd bring statistics in the media on a, on a regular basis. Um, uh, you know, at the beginning of a course, I would bring them in and model how to discuss the statistics. But after a while, sometimes I'd assign it, but it's, it's really fun. So a lot of students would actually just volunteer and find things and they were just excited to bring things in and discuss them. And it's, it's really fun. It's really fun to put up a New York Times article, the lauded New York Times, and sort of pick apart the statistics and, <laughs> and yeah. point out, point out some of the irresponsible statistics and, and I am not picking on the New York Times. It happens everywhere. <laughs> like, like it's, it's part of, uh, journalism is fast paced and you have to get things out. I, I'm not picking up <laughs> a moment with the New York Times, but, but just all I'm saying is very, very respected publications still require some amount of statistical savvy and critical thinking. If you want to get at, at some, understanding of what's actually happening on the ground. Right. Um, so yeah, we do that. We bring in articles um, and discuss them as a class. And it's really neat to watch people's understanding evolve over a year where at the beginning of the year, I'd present an article and, and you know, coyly I would ask what they think. And they'd say, oh, that looks, that looks very well informed and very, that's, uh -huh. that is, that's those are some good statistics right there. <laughs> And then by the end of the year, to, to watch them build their sort of skeptical glasses for viewing things in the media. And, and so then we'd bring in an article and they'd start picking it apart immediately. And I, I don't want them to distrust everything, obviously, right. but to develop that, that um, critical eye for the things you read. And, and the simple understanding that, 
that the truth is nuanced and complex, way more complex than any one headline can make. Right. Yeah, this is interesting because I remember, you know, I went to a liberal arts school and the first year you spend like, uh, you again. so let me just search my video, see if that helps. Um, All right. Okay, so a little bit of a uh, hiccup, but we're back. The so you know you're talking about um, students would you would use uh, kind of real world newspaper uh, articles and things like that for for teaching your kids critical thinking skills. I was you know it kind of resonated with me because in the first year of liberal arts school, you know a lot of times you're doing like English language classes or history classes, and and it's really you know. The, a point of the liberal arts curriculum is to liberate you from mm -hmm. liberate your mind from the you know shackles of whatever uh, you've grown up in and, and allow you to think on your own and be critical critical thinker um, but there's not really a quantitative component um, in many of those curricula like it's mm. not a there's not a statistical thinking but it does feel like to me that statistics is that sort of foundational critical thinking for uh, numbers. Yeah, the school where I was uh, these past two years, um, I was lucky there's this, uh, this teacher who trained as an economist and was teaching economics and history. And so he and I joined forces a lot in trying to spread basic statistical understanding throughout the curriculum. So not just in the math department, but in, uh, history and really any department that was willing to listen <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. because you can apply it everywhere i mean even in language courses there's there's room for that to be something discussed as a unit or just incorporated through discussion or um yeah so that that was great and then so i think the the interesting thing for both of us i mean you you were in educational neuroscience right is is this bridge between education and then the more data science fields that we work in now? It's it's sort of similar in data in data science. There's a massive influx right now of people who are training as data scientists. So maybe they do, maybe they did as a degree, maybe they did one of these boot camps, maybe they're doing something. But a lot of them are coming from this perspective of of statistics is a button I push, right? I push a button and I get a p value. I push a button, I get a chi squared value. And if it's above this, I do this. And if it's below that, I do that. The end, right? Right. The um there's not always the depth of understanding of, oh, what are the limitations to this test? Or what is the math behind it? So I can really understand if it's appropriate for what I'm doing. And often it's not. Right. And in in industry, what uh I've seen a lot, I think I assume you have um is even if you say that out loud people say people think well it's an answer though and i i just need an answer <laughs> yep and yeah. it is an answer right but it's it is the, it, it's it can be so I, off so i've been thinking about this a lot because um you know we're uh, we're still building out we're maturing as a company and and building our data systems and um, and so a lot of times, like everything that I say, it kind of comes with a caveat. I'm like, well, uh, but the data is kind of like iffy. So just take it with a grain of salt. And it, it strikes me that there's really, it's almost like there's two sorts of tasks. There's investigative tasks in which like you need a person and the person is the most important part of the, the equation. Like the data is there, you got to investigate it, but it's investigative, right? And you kind of have to be critical. Um, it's almost like journalism. And then... Um, and then there's like robot tasks, which are, you know, if, if the data is good enough or you, if it's like not important enough that you can just make automated decisions and, um, then let it happen and don't, and don't even put a human in the mix, like just make right. it all fully automated. When I lived in, um, Portland, Oregon, there was, uh, I think it comes up once in a while, but the, on the ballot was whether to put fluoride in the drinking water. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something that many, many cities in North America do. Um, 
And so there's, there's already a strong set of data, data with evidence that uh, trace them, like it's a, it's a specific, you, you, you wanna be below a certain threshold. Right. Certain amounts of fluoride in the drinking water are correlated strongly with um, more positive dental outcomes, uh, especially for low income, lower income populations that maybe can't afford regular visits to the dentist, et cetera. Right. Um, and so in Portland, there is pushback and a lot of people would cite a study saying, you know, fluoride um, causes these diseases and death and blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and this, this, I wish I had thought to look the, up the details of this before we, we spoke, because I'm, I'm forgetting all the exact details. But um, one of the studies was from a population in maybe rural China along a very populated, uh, uh, polluted river uh -huh. where there were high traces of a bunch of things in the water, not just fluoride. <laughs> um, and the fluoride concentration was like a thousand times what we recommend for the municipal yep. drinking water. Yep. But it, like, it also had like, I don't know, like uranium and Giardia or whatever it was. <laughs> like, and so like fluoride was the least of their problems. And that's, that was like one of the main studies from which people were drawing as look, fluoride is bad for you. <laughs> right, right. And I couldn't convince people otherwise. It was, it was, but th it's a good, to me, this is a good example of, of the kind of savvy I would like to make uh, universal. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's hard because the, um, you know, you, it's this balance of utility and, um, utility and certainty. So the more certain, you know, if you feel more certain, if you see something and it can support your opinion, then you want to be certain about it. Uh, but if you kind of, as you become more statistically savvy, you're less certain um, mm -hmm. about most, about many things, I guess. Um, but you get takes, that takes time and takes energy and um, it's hard. It's a, it's a whole, it's like a muscle you got to flex. This inhibition, like, I'm, let me, I'm going to check this out for a second. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so with, um, with both audiences, with education and in our field of data science, um, I found there's this, there's this sort of delicate walk. Uh, I taught high school, so high school students, um, they can talk about a lot of adult topics. You can talk about... Um, um, I don't know, you, you can talk about politics and death and love and sex, and you can, you can just talk about a lot of adult things as long as it's still age appropriate and you do it sensitively. Right. And, um, and so one thing I do with them is, is talk about very real things, but um, at, f at first, at least, I'd avoid anything incendiary, where I'd, anything that would immediately mm -hmm. just become polarizing right. and... Right. So I, I didn't do much on politics at the beginning, especially. And then maybe later in the year, once we have a relationship, if I did politics, I'd be very, very clear that, okay, we're here to talk about the merits of a study or the merits of an article. And any political views are welcome, but it's, they're also besides the point. Right. And in doing that, I think, I hope, I modeled ways to, to what you're saying, to build that instinct of, oh, let me just weigh the facts on their merits. Maybe I have strong emotions about this topic, but let me just look at the facts for a second on their merits. And that was really important to me. And I, I feel like I do it in the data science community as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe not about politics, but I feel like people get invested in their Python package or they get invested in their uh, you know, machine learning algorithm and and um, I try to maybe instead of just saying, oh, that's not the right algorithm for this, maybe take a step back and talk about processes in general and talk about and like build a sense of, oh, let's think about this empirically and then maybe address, yep. you know. Yeah, yeah, that's um, that's interesting. I just, I had something I was going to say, but I, I lost it now. Um, how, how did your the way you teach change uh, over like, how, how has the way you 
taught um, changed over time? Because you're a very veteran teacher. You've taught for years and years, lots of different audiences. Uh, yeah. I think at the core of my teaching was a question. Um, and it's, the question was, was about, I guess it's the question about, you know, nature versus nurture about, um, about potential versus, uh, performance. And, and I think, so I, I, I was very lucky. I had this excellent, excellent education growing up. I have a decent brain and combine those. And I, I learned a lot, you know, and I think as an early, in my early years as a teacher, I put a lot of pressure on students to learn a lot. Mm -hmm. And I was aware that different students have different limits. And I, I think I was a very kind patient teacher in lots of ways, but I don't think I fully understood. I don't think as an early teacher, I, I definitely didn't believe that there was a limit to what people could learn. Hmm. And I don't necessarily, I don't think, I don't, I still don't think <laughs> that there is necessarily a limit to what people learn. I'm just more sensitive to how that, that for me, learning in some ways was quite easy. Learning in some other ways was hard. Uh, but those same ways won't work for everyone. And it will happen at different paces and in different ways. And also one key factor in learning is do you want to learn it? And yeah. some people don't want to learn all the things that I want them to learn. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, I feel like my teaching just became more nuanced and sensitive to the different ways that people learn. Whereas when I very first started teaching, I just, maybe, maybe to be honest, I thought everyone could learn the way I learned. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've definitely seen that Danielle, Danielle taught, uh, sixth grade. And it's like when in the teach for America, uh, you know, group that we, that we started with, it's all about like, you know, pushing kids to the limit basically. And like pushing them past what, what, what they think their limits are and, and getting them on track. And it's like, there's soup, there's really tremendous value in that. Um, mm -hmm. and in breaking, you know, setting really high expectations, but then there is, um, as we've grown and just seen our own kids develop, it's like, wow, you know, that everyone is so different. And, and even just thinking through my own learning trajectory, it's like, oh yeah, certain things, uh, come easy. Certain things just take time. And it's like, you, you know, you don't see once, once you're a little older, you start seeing like, oh, this thing took me five years to understand, um, or to grasp, or it, it took me three times learning it, um, in a class for me really to intuit it. Mm -hmm. Um, so what do you think? so what what kind of implications does that have for um things like math and data you know data science skills or programming skills that are, are relevant for data science um because those are not topics that are often taught in schools period mm -hmm. and then um and then obviously things are are coming out you know everything's a new tool right every every everyone has to learn a lot of new things yeah i mean uh, I, I don't know if this is the purpose of your question, but one thing that sort of stuck in my craw, is that, wait, is that the phrase? Stuck in my craw? Yeah. I'm bad, I'm bad with phrases. Uh, was how um, civics actually was slowly removed from the United States public education curriculum over time, um, which I think is a mistake. I, I think we want informed citizens capable of doing their jobs. Um, some people think it was purposeful as part of a de greater design. I'm not getting into that, but it was slowly removed. Um, I think statistics can fill in where maybe civics, uh, the, fill in some of the hole left by civics because um, statistics is part of a strong STEM curriculum. STEM right now is, uh, is, very important across the country. People are giving it more attention than they used to. They think it's very important. And so civics, so statistics might be the sneaky way to bring back civics. 
that's interesting, but it's got to be a sneaky way to bring back civics because, uh, <laughs> and not just like statistics, uh, you know, quantitative methods, I would think, because what you're describing is, is not, uh, is not just the like, Hey, here's an experiment, beer, beer sales and ice cream sales, you know, they both go up and are they causal? Uh, like it's, that's not what you're talking about. Uh, or just like Gantt casino game uh, experiments. Well, you need to do that too. So I guess uh, going back to your original question of how I teach statistics, part of it was bringing in real examples and then the other is have them do it, have them do as many experiments as possible. Yeah. Because you can tell them what an experiment is, but until you actually do it, um, you don't really understand. I mean, I feel like for, with us, for example, again, I had a great education but it wasn't really until grad school when I was really doing experiments, not sort of the stuff I did in undergrad, but like right. really responsible and publishing, like uh, that a lot of things clicked, like basic things about the experimental process. And right. um, so having them do it is important, even if they are looking into the relationship between ice cream sales and sunglasses sales or, you know, whatever the thing is. Yeah. Um, and so I think between those two, You'll, you can develop a, a really strong curriculum. And at the end, you have people who can not only produce, but just consume statistics responsibly. Hmm. Yeah. Did that answer your question? I, I went on off a tangent, maybe. No, no, I think that's a, I think that's a great, um, a great answer. Do you, do you think, do you think that a lot of the programs right now that focus on data science, do you think this is happening? I guess is my question, because you could argue that there's probably more statistics focused education now than there ever has been. Um, mm -hmm. You have it online everywhere. You've got all of these data science boot camps, all of these data science master's degrees, um, and it's, they're really advertising it to any, anybody. Um, yes and no. So like our conversation is spanning sort of adult industry level stuff and then yeah. child education yeah. and i'd say on the child education side no I, I think when it comes to the public education statistics tends to be an elective um and um it's not well that's changing a bit but it hasn't always been a core part of other departments like history um so i think if i had my way with public education i'd start I'd start with um, experimental design and statistics way earlier before high school and really build it throughout the maths, throughout the humanities. Um, not because it's my pet topic and I, I should get what I want, but be, because I think it's important to understanding all of those things. Because it's important to understanding all of the maths, because it's important to understanding the humanities. Yeah. It, it really, I think you said it well, like, it ends up being a filter that you have for everything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I think after I took statistics in undergrad, it, it literally changed my life. It changed how I read the world. Right. And so I'm not, I'm not saying statistics is important because I find it important. I think it's actually important for all of these disciplines. And then, so for the adult part that you're talking about, um, you know, there's, there's this big push in data science and, and not just in the field of data science, but lots of people tangential, you know, um, you know, biomedical research and things like that. And so you have things like, you know, these boot camps, you know, data quest or data incubator, or whatever. You have lots of degrees popping up, masters and even doctoral degrees in data science. Yep. Um, and I, I think, I think there's strengths and weaknesses to both. I think the academic, Academic programs um, really teach a lot of the rigor and give you a strong foundation. Um, not all of them, not all people who graduate from academic programs are necessarily fit for industry though, which is, right. well, they value rigor. They also, they're fast paced and need answers. And, yep. uh, and then on the other side, the things like, you know, the more, informal things like, you know, data quest or whatever, they, um, they do a really good job of bringing in real data, bringing in real applications of statistics and data science. But, um, 
but maybe you don't always get the rigor. You don't necessarily know the limitations of a test or when not to use it. Or... Right. Right. I think one of the and, and one of the things that I think would be absent is this connection to other um, to, to other courses and topics. Like if, as as things become more a la carte, you you aren't able for the statistics teacher to partner with the history teacher and you know and kind of integrate or, or build connections across um across disciplines mm -hmm. which i think is one of the most interesting things that you you know you've mentioned um and it, it reminds me of this I, I just listened to this podcast on the history of rome uh mm -hmm. like 200 podcast it was like it was like 100 hours of, of history of rome it was fantastic but um you know one of the things one of the big points that he mentions at the end is, is that sometimes when you're looking at history, it can feel like everything was determined, you know, predetermined, but in right. reality, like there's, you're, you're only living forward. People are only, have ever, only ever lived forward. And there's so much risk and uncertainty uh, at play that, um, you know, I, you know, having an, you can easily discount that if you're just reading, feeling like it's stale, but. Um, right. Right, like maybe two or three hundred years from now, when when maybe the narrative has settled down a bit, people will look back at this COVID nineteen moment and be like, "Oh, of course it happened because blah," and of course it spread like this because blah. But yep, right. But right yep. now we're like, "Oh, what's happening?" <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Um, that's cool. So um, I guess just a couple more questions. What uh, what were there any things that you, in your teaching, that like helped statistics click with kids uh, or adults? Like, are, are there any? Do you have any silver bullet type of things or things that you would do over and over again if if you uh, if you were teaching? Yeah, that's a great question. I think um, the statistics in the media that I was talking to you about was one of the most successful, just because it it uh, combined it is very engaging it kept people's interest they they were excited to talk about it um it was applicable to people's lives and it's just fun it's just sort of fun to um feel smarter than the new york times you know <laughs> <laughs> um, there's this one article that edward tufty uses in his lectures from the new york times that's and it's the one that's coming to mind and that's uh -huh. That's why I really shouldn't keep saying the New York Times because we've, we've used all like <laughs> high and low, right? Like we've, yeah. we've used the tabloids, we've used the economists. We've, you can find examples of statistics um, that are used well and poorly almost everywhere. And sometimes it's not even that they're used poorly as much as they're very misleading if you yourself don't have a decent understanding. Right. Right. So uh, the example from the New York Times that I've been thinking about, there's this graph. Um, it's a smooth curve that starts maybe two years in the past, but then goes I think, 10 or 12 years in the future. And it's completely smooth. And I think, I think they labeled it pretty responsibly. They said their source and they said what it represents. And, uh, but when I showed it to students and I didn't say anything, they just thought this was pretty factual. Right. And then I'd bring up, I'd bring up, well, look at the dates. It only goes two years in the past, but it goes 12 years in the future. What do you think about that? And, and I, I'd, even then I'd, I'd really have to explain some of the dangers of extrapolation. And then I'd also say for the two years they have, do you ever get a smooth curve in any of the work you've ever done <laughs> ever? <laughs> and they were like, Oh no, we don't. So that's actually, that's actually just their model, not the data itself. And, you know, like, I think the New York Times labeled all of that, but without understanding it, you, you don't, that's not the thing you focus on. You just see a curve and you think, aha, here's where we're going 12 years from now. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, and if you put all the points, if you put all the scatterplot points on there, people would be like, well, what's all this? <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> It's such a tight line you have to balance. I mean, that's true in industry too. Like I have to, I just think so much more about like what I need to exclude mm -hmm. uh, without lying and like, how can I exclude as much as possible responsibly? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Than I used to. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. 
any Good. other you have any other like any other thoughts you want to kind of leave us leave leave with i've got like five minutes left yeah and statistics and education and data science let's and on anything yeah i mean i guess right now i'm focused much more on industry because uh, that's where i'm working i work in transportation um yeah i don't know it's Right now, um, I've published some data publicly, or our company has. Mm -hmm. And even then, it's sort of interesting to see people react to it. Um, you know, one group took our data and did some analyses with it using census data and different things. And, and um, they, they showed it to us, which is great. And, and the work they were doing is super interesting. The questions they were asking were super interesting, but it was, they built their entire analysis off of our data without contacting us first to ask about any limitations in our data. Right. And I thought that was, I thought that was a very interesting commentary on industry. Yeah. In academia, you probably wouldn't build your analysis off someone else's data anyway. You just <laughs> wouldn't trust it maybe. I don't know, but yeah, yeah. There's there's multiple yeah, reasons why you ask. might not do that, but yeah, right. <laughs> but you definitely ask first and get you get a full understanding of okay, what does this data represent? What do these data yeah. not represent? What? How did you collect them? Uh, were there obvious errors that you found in your collection and methodology? You know, um, whereas in industry, and uh, this, again, this isn't a criticism of those people or anyone. Industry is just faster and and looser. It yeah. just is. Yeah. Um, and I, I thought that was really interesting because I, I would never do that. I would right. ask the people first, but I think it's very common in industry. Well, it's, you know, when you can get one of the issues with, uh, academic work is it's so hard to get to oftentimes, right? Cause it's, yeah. it's probably on some dude's flash drive in there in his desk. Uh, right. Right. And whereas in industry, it's like, your the point is to get people to use it so you expose it publicly by a nice structured api and people can just yeah. pull it down and um start using it and then other people can start using their data yeah uh it, it it's it's so you end up doing things like 538 and building ensemble stuff but um you know if you if you're in that in between zone where you've just got a couple of uh data sets and you haven't gotten your like 538 10,000 you know model you know on some sets of models Right. Then you're doing dangerous science, really. Uh, right, right. That's probably not. Yeah, I mean, producible. I said all these things, and I, I didn't mean to frame them as critical of industry, because they're critical. I'm, I have praise and criticism for both, right? Like, academia is too slow. The firewall is too high. The, the, the pathways of communication don't exist where they should be. You know, like, there, there are lots of downsides and pros to both. I love the rigor of academia. I love right. um, how people think through their methodology. And, but I like the pace of industry also and how sometimes you do need something that's good enough. Right. You know, and that's, I think there's value in that kind of thinking. Right. Well, and there's also about, I mean, you know, both academia and industry oftentimes like, well, I, I guess, I guess you can't make that blanket statement, but this idea of openness, right? It's, it's better for an organization to take your data that is open and out there and someone else can take it and then build something off of it mm -hmm. than to have their own data set that they just kind of put out there and make um, observation of. Because at least someone can come in and criticize it. Yeah. This is maybe another, a whole nother chat because one thing I would want to ask you is when it comes to openness, you know, industry and academia both have aspirations to openness that they sometimes can't meet because of the competitive nature of both. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I wonder, I was, I'd be curious how you feel about that, but that's probably another conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, that's, I mean, it's very tough. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, we, leverage a lot of open source technologies for our own stack, but you can't, you can't build a business off of just leveraging, you can't build a software business off of just leveraging open source and um, 
opening everything up. You've either got to make services out of it or find some way to profit off of it. Um, yeah. To, to keep it going. I think, you know, and then the other, the other risk is uh, privacy and data for sure. Uh, yeah. You can't, exactly. it's often not your data <laughs> to give uh, or to make open. Um, yeah. To, to be clear, the things I share right now are uh, aggregate data that cannot identify any one individual yeah. ever. So yeah. that's very important to me and our company. Yeah. Um, just out of curiosity, professional curiosity, is there, are there, what laws are in place for that, for that type of data? in Canada? Um, that's a really great question. I'd, I'd have to maybe consult. We have a, like a privacy working group and like there are other people who are in charge of, um, what do you call it? Compliance. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we're actually making sure we meet the EU guidelines, which are some of the more strict ones out there. Yep. Um, which is why I'm, yeah, I'll look into the, Canada ones, but my understanding is that like anything that's in the Canada ones, we're meeting with the EU ones also. Yeah. But yeah, I can look that, into that it. Sense. GDPR I think is the most uh, restrictive, but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, that's like another level. You've got, you've got kind of the data, you know, critical thinking about data, but then also like knowing legal obligations and um, compliance and all that stuff. Um, yeah. And just ethical, yeah. you know, ethical guidelines, right? Uh, well, cool. This is great, Jonathan. I really enjoyed chatting with you. We'll have to get yeah. This was good too. Get another being, one at some time. Yeah, the the being recorded was interesting. <laughs> I hope I, I hope I didn't <laughs> say anything too. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I, at some point, I realized I was like being really critical of the New York Times. It's like uh. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, you're on their list, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs>